Our scripture this morning tells of the risen Jesus visiting the disciples once again as they were fishing, catching few fish in their nets. This is John chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. <clears throat> After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Because there were so many fish, this disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son out of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son out of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own seat, your own belt, and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. And this he said to him, follow me. May God bless to our hearing and understanding this reading from the Holy Word. Amen. Amen. Any kiddos want to come up and uh, talk about this story a little bit more? Oh. Hey guys. So, I'm wondering if y'all can, so tell me about, do y'all have any traditions in your family around meals? around food and stuff. Is there something you guys like holidays or something you always do when you eat a meal in your family or anything like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, always have turkey. Yeah. Is there uh what what so what uh when you're having the meal a meal with your family, are there certain things that you think of? Like when I said, you know, what, what was, when I, if I ask you, what's a meal like at your house? What do you think of? How would you describe it? That's a lot like our house too. Absolutely. Yeah. hundred percent. That is for real. So, uh, I, our, in our family, and we don't always remember to do it, but we have, um, we say grace, um, by singing. And we say, what is it we sing, Emmy? You want to sh That's right. Thank you, God, for good food. Thank you, God. Amen. Yeah. It's really simple, and it's great. And so, we, and I, I do it sometimes just when I'm out with somebody else or with myself or something. So, 
It just is, I don't know, it's a way we can easily say thanks to God before the meal. So Jesus, you see this picture here? It's a picture of a family having a meal and the guy's laughing. It looks like they're enjoying each other's company and stuff. I don't know if it's a special meal or if it's just, you know, they all happen to be together. Um, my wife, April, uh, she, every Sunday almost, would go to her granny's house, which was actually across the street from the church where she grew up going to, and they'd have lunch, like her family would have lunch together every Sunday afternoon. So when I started be, you know, d- dating her and would go home sometimes with her, I would go and be at granny's house, and we'd have biscuits and vegetables and whatever kind of food that granny had made. It was always like pretty great. We all crowded in this table, and we'd have to, some of us sit on stools and stuff like that. So it was, it was always like a really neat feeling to be together with people you cared about and share a meal. So is that, a, is that does that sound right? Like even if you're eating in the living room or even if you're going out and getting fast, it's, it, there's something really connecting about eating together, right? Yeah. So what is this behind me? It is some sort of communion table. So, and what does it say right here, Cadence? Thank you, Cadence and Emmy. This do in remembrance of me. So this is a table... And do you remember the story about the supper where Jesus told his friends about? And we, and we remember when we do communion? Yeah? So we are, when we gather every single week, why don't you all come up here? You can like actually like see this. Do you want to come touch the table and stuff, Emma? You want to come touch this table? What's on the table? It's bread and a cup. Yeah? We actually don't have any juice in it. There's a cross. There's candles. Yeah? So this is the place where we get together. We know we all we go over there and have the th- cups, or we pass the plates around. But this is but the reason this is in the center of our church is because eating together and Jesus feeding us, it's like us coming together for a family meal every Sunday. And so like God's our father or mother, and or just our parent, we could say, and Jesus is like our brother, and the Holy Spirit is here too. Maybe we could think of the Holy Spirit is our sister or friend or something like that. And we together all come together and we share this meal. And so that's the, one of Jesus' favorite ways of spending time with people was having food. And in the story today, he actually, well, this is the last time he shows up, well, it's not the last time he shows up his friends, it's the last time he eats with them in the scriptures. He may have had other meals with them, but he's, he's died, he's come back to life, but he still eats. And he comes back, and what he does is he says, hey, let's have breakfast together. And so he feeds them. He gives them food. He, it's a family meal for the disciples with their friend Jesus. So that's what we do every Sunday when we have communion. So I hope, you can, I hope that helps you feel a little bit more like special about communion and why it is we do it, and it's such a central part of what we do, that it's our family meal, and we're all together in it. You all want to pray together before you go to children's worship? All right, well, let's turn around and say this prayer, or you can read from up there. Let's all pray together. Dear God, God, thank you for sending us Jesus, Jesus, who loves us, us, who feeds us, us, and who calls us to follow him. him. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. And now let's sing. This little light of mine I'm going to let it shine, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Do you want to go to the children's worship with them? You don't have to. It's okay if you don't want to go, that's fine. Sorry. Thanks, guys. So this is, so again, we're talking this week, well, this these next several weeks of Easter about being resurrection people. Talking, telling, we're hearing these stories about what Jesus did with the disciples after he came back from the dead. And so we have this one last story that we'll hear from John's gospel that explores the disciples' reaction to Jesus following the resurrection. And this story from John's Gospel that we heard today is one of my favorite stories in Scripture. I had tears in my eyes at times while I was writing this sermon, actually. Um, It's a story that I could talk about for a week. There are so many details and so many ways you can draw meaning from those details. 
But I want to just take a moment. I want to take a moment before we dive into those details and just experience this moment of tender reunion between Jesus and his disciples. And this so experiencing the story is an essential way to engage with Scripture, to let the stories become part of us, to have a relationship with the stories. So often we get focused on what the Bible tells us intellectually. We get into arguments about what the Bible tells us, how the Bible tells us we should behave, or we try to draw conclusions in that way about what the Bible tells us is right or wrong, about what we should believe as Christians, what makes us real Christians. Do we believe the right things the right way? And we even see many Christians trying to predict the future based on what the Bible says. But that's not really the way we interpret the Bible as disciples of Christ. We do those things, but the main way is that we want the text to shape us. We want the Bible to be something we're in relationship with. So many of the time, we want the Bible to be a text full of proof to underpin whatever argument we're making. But honestly, that's not the purpose of the Bible. It's not the reason it was written. And in fact, we can draw so-called proof for almost any argument from the Bible. If we pick selectively and twist the scriptures, and forget what the Bible really is. As one of my classmates said in seminary, and it's something I'll say a lot because I'll always remember it, the Bible is our family stories. And our family stories don't provide proof for our arguments. Our family stories tell us who we are, and they shape who we are. And this story that we hear today is about Jesus' relationship with his disciples. It's specifically about Jesus doing the work to repair a relationship that he didn't break. Repairing a relationship that he didn't break. So in a sense, it's the very heart of the gospel that Jesus reaches out to us to repair the relationship that we break with God and with each other. The disciples, as our story begins, have gone back to Galilee. Remember last week they were in a locked room in Jerusalem, in the big city, the dangerous city, the place where they didn't belong. But now, and we we don't really know how much later it is, They have returned to the Sea of Galilee, and they go fishing. And honestly, that might be one of the reasons this story resonates with me personally, because I grew up in a family that went fishing together. So this story is helping me claim who I am as I connect with the story of Jesus. And the disciples fish all night, and they don't catch anything. Remember, Peter and at least the sons of Zebedee, John and James, so three of the disciples in this boat are professional fishermen. So this is pretty disappointing. And when dawn comes, they see someone on the beach. And what do you do when you see someone fishing? It's obligatory. It's part of the fisherman's code. You say, how are they biting? We caught anything? It's required. You have to say it. And so Jesus says, a little bit different, he says, children, you have no fish, have you? He knows already. And maybe they think he's another fisherman who finished his bad night early. But instead of just continuing to talk about the bad night fishing, Jesus tells them, try the other side of the boat. Which, when you know about fish, doesn't seem like it would make much sense. If you've been fishing the same spot, maybe a different bait would help, or maybe a different net. I've never done net fishing, really. But just being in the same spot and doing the same thing again shouldn't yield new results. But in this case, it does. They pull up a huge catch of fish, 
Later in the story, it specifies that they catch 153 fish, large fish. Did you notice that detail? And this is one of those places we could get lost, and people have for centuries. Why 153? What's the symbol there? Why is that important? Is there a secret message in the numbers? One, one idea from the Middle Ages is that in that time, they thought there were 153 species of fish in the world. And so that was an example of everything being included. But really, what does 153 mean? Because maybe, just maybe, that's actually the exact number of fish the disciples caught, and the author of John actually remembers that detail, that that number was passed down as part of the family story of those first generations of the church. Or maybe it has significance, but we're not going to get sidetracked with it right now, because the more important stuff in this story is how the disciples respond. John tells us that the disciple whom Jesus loved realizes first, imagine it for a moment, visualize this boat full of men hauling on the net. They're straining with the effort and laughing in amazement. And suddenly, the beloved disciple, and in tradition it's John, the author of this gospel, is the idea, the youngest of them. He turns to Peter and says, his eyes are just a light with joy, I imagine, and shouts, It is the Lord! Can you hear the excitement in his voice? And Peter responds like Peter always does, with gusto and not much forethought. He throws on his clothes, because apparently fishing naked was a thing you did back then. <laughs> did you know there's a lot of naked people in the Bible? It's kind of risque, actually. And Peter jumps in the water. I just love this. Just dives in. And, and I, he puts on his clothes to jump in the water. Right? It just, just shows. He, he also leaves the other guys in the boat to finish pulling in this huge catch of fish. But do you feel Peter's love for Jesus, though? His joy that overwhelms his common sense? Peter comes dripping out of the water onto the gravel of the beach. I always imagine they're on the east side of the lake and that the sun is coming up behind Jesus. I don't know why, that's how I imagine it. The glow of dawn lets Peter see that Jesus has lit a fire and he's cooking breakfast. And he says, come, bring some of those fish you caught. Let's eat. This this is the way the Lord of the universe comes to find his disciples. This man has been raised from the dead. It's the greatest miracle in history. But there isn't a triumphant parade. If it was a blockbuster movie or an epic fantasy novel, Jesus would walk up marble stairs to his throne and take his rightful place while everyone cheered and the trumpets played. I actually looked up, I was looking up uh, images of the Lord of the Rings and the ending of Star Wars, because that was sort of what I was thinking. Couldn't find a good one. But instead of that, instead of that triumphant parade, Jesus keeps being Jesus. Jesus. He gathers his friends where they are, and he says, let's eat. And then we come to the part of the story I do want to unpack a little bit. Jesus' conversation with Peter, the way he goes about helping Peter heal. In the beginning of the story, we hear that Peter goes back to his old vocation of fisherman. Peter and the other disciples seem to have returned to their comfort zone. But Peter, the fisherman, fails to catch any fish. At the very beginning of this story, Peter could accurately be described as a failure. How often have you had a time in your life when circumstances made you feel like a failure? 
Was it a time you really did fail? Because sometimes what we see as a failure on our part was unavoidable or not something we could reasonably see coming. But every one of us will, at some point in our lives, drop the ball. We will really and truly make a mess of things. We will hurt people we care about. We will let down people we value. We will not live up to our best values. Just this week, I found out that I'd dropped the ball in my job here as your pastor. It wasn't a big thing. You probably won't hear anything about it. But because of an assumption I made that I could have easily corrected with one conversation, I made a mistake that felt huge in that moment. But did the world end? No. Obviously, we're still here, right? Did I feel like I wanted to crawl in a hole and die? Yes. Is anyone talking about firing me? No. And when I calmed down enough, I realized it would be ridiculous for someone to react like that. And the most important question in, you, in a failure is, did I actually hurt anyone? And in this case, I'm not sure. But it's not damage that can't be repaired, at least. And honestly, I know that I make a much bigger issue of my mistakes and failings than anyone else does, generally. But what I do know is that when we fail, the way to fix that is to go and address the situation, not hide from it. At the same time, it isn't always best to just jump into action like Peter. Often we can make things worse by overreacting because of our own guilt or shame about the failure. And Jesus knows this. And as a Christian, as a resurrection person, the first person you should talk to when you've dropped the ball is Jesus. Because I actually went and sat down and prayed about it, Jesus was the one who said, now, do you really think this is such a big deal? Have you really, like, done something unforgivable? Can you put it in perspective, Tim? I don't hear Jesus' voice, but it helps me to you know, reflect back, kind of understand how Jesus feels about me. And this is the thing, this is the thing to realize, is that no matter how big a mess you've made of things, you can be assured of how Jesus will respond to you. It's the way he responds to Peter in today's story. Because remember that Peter has not just failed in his old vocation as a fisherman, he's also failed in his new vocation as a disciple of Jesus. In all four of the gospel accounts, we hear of Peter's denial. Back before Jesus was killed, he was taken away by the authorities. And in each version of the story of that night, Peter follows him. But when they get to where they question Jesus, people start asking Peter, aren't you one of his followers? Some version of this question. In John's question, which we're reading from this morning, in chapter 18, Peter is asked bluntly, aren't you one of his disciples? And Peter responds just as bluntly, I am not. Hours after claiming he will follow Jesus to death, Peter has claimed he is not Jesus' disciple. And afterwards, it says that he went out and wept bitterly. And since then, of course, we've had Jesus' crucifixion and his return from death. He has appeared to Peter and the other disciples. We heard one of those stories last week. So now we're at a point where Peter knows Jesus hasn't rejected him. But does Peter still feel like a failure? Does he lack faith in himself, even if his faith in Jesus is as strong as ever? After breakfast, I imagine Jesus walking over to Peter, who's still finishing his breakfast. Again, that's how I see the scene in my own imagination. Jesus walking away from the other disciples who are gathered at the campfire across the beach to Peter. And he sits down next to him. And he asks Peter, very formally, using his given name, not the nickname that Jesus gave him, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? 
And Peter replies, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs, Jesus says. And again, he asks if Peter loves him and tells him, tend my sheep. And then for a third time, Jesus asks the same question, and Peter is exasperated, right? Does Jesus not believe him fully? Is this a test? What is Jesus doing? And Peter finally says, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus responds, feed my sheep. He is calling Peter back to his purpose. And Peter feels it in his bones. He trusts that Jesus knows his heart now. And he can also trust his own heart again. And at this point, Jesus tells him that his life will not be like it was. He has been called to a purpose. And that purpose will eventually cost him his life. Although Jesus doesn't say it plainly to Peter. He just tells Peter that someone else will lead him where he doesn't want to go. Does he mean, does Jesus mean the executioners Peter will face in Rome one day? Or maybe Jesus means himself. Because when we take up the vocation of following Jesus, of being resurrection people, of continuing to deepen our relationship with this risen Savior, we are very likely to be led places we don't want to go. It may not be to the cross. It probably won't. But there will be crosses in our lives, things that we have to lay down, realizations about who we are, times where we get it wrong, times we find we have failed. But Jesus gives Peter a very clear job description the same one he gave years ago when he first called him, possibly from that very same beach early one morning. He tells Peter, follow me. I want you to hear that now. Hear Jesus telling you, follow me. Because this story wasn't written for Peter's sake. Peter's journey had ended at an upside-down cross long before John wrote his gospel. These words are written for us. Jesus is calling, follow me. That is the whole job description of a Christian, the job description of a resurrection people. The requirement, notice, is not that we be effective. Jesus doesn't ask, can you feed my sheep? He asks, do you love me? Jesus doesn't call us when we're ready. He doesn't need us to have the right job or the right knowledge or the right amount of money in our bank account. He calls Peter the fisherman when Peter knows nothing about Jesus. And then he calls Peter again three years later, after Peter has denied being his disciple and betrayed him. But Jesus knows Peter loves him. And he knows if you love him. He knows that you love him. That's not a question. That's a statement. Jesus knows that you love him. And Jesus doesn't expect you to be perfect, and thank God, not me either. Jesus doesn't expect us to have it all figured out. Jesus doesn't even expect us never to betray or deny him. Jesus knows everything, everything about us, and he's called us anyway. And if you love him, he calls you. Follow me. Because the love itself is the call. The love is the purpose and the preparation. The burning in our hearts and the joy in our eyes, the cry like the beloved disciple of recognition, it is the Lord. That's all Jesus requires of us. Love me. Follow me. Don't wait. 
Don't wait to be ready. Jump in and swim to shore because Jesus is waiting for you, failures and all. Amen.